Hi guys, welcome back. Uh, this is Matt Chat, episode 453, uh, featuring part two of my interview with the great Brian Hines, this time on the game Tyranny. Uh, we finish up our discussion about the Outer Worlds, and then we launch into all kinds of stuff around uh, Tyranny, the combat system, the dialogues, the story, the nature of, of evil. Uh, I ask him some, uh, or ask uh, Brian some of the questions sent in by you guys. Uh, so I think it's a really good discussion, a lot of exciting stuff. We also get into the future of tyranny and the campaign setting and much, much more. A lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Brian Hines. You know, I really appreciate these sort of shorter, or however you want to say it, you know. Yeah. The smaller scope just makes it easier to complete, and plus, even better, you actually get to replay it now. <laughs> yeah. You know, see yeah. some of those other paths. It's more focused rather than shorter. I mean, is this is this for you more like just a virtue, making a virtue of necessity, I guess, or is it something that you think is, uh, you know, that you would choose to do even if you had unlimited money and time? Well, I think, I mean, often if you have unlimited money and time, like it's very easy to keep spinning your wheels and not really making forward progress. Like one of the things that that you learn very quickly, I think, in any any job or any creative endeavor, is that boundaries help you focus and move forward mm -hmm. like if you have if you can just keep like running off in any direction you want to like that's fun and all but before long you've like now spread all your focus in too many areas and you can't really like get any one of them very far along so by actually having some limitations and constraints on your your creativity and energy you can actually drive that a lot further than you would otherwise um like personally i remember like being a kid and playing rpg games like I would like my. What are some of the ones you like to play? Like, uh, to the, like the original like uh, Dragon Quest, Dragon Warrior games on the NES, oh, sure. um, Ultima. Um, like a lot of uh, like Crystallis was one of my favorite my favorite RPGs of uh, like the, the first JRPG I ever played was that even before Final Fantasy. But like I remember, I, I would be able to purchase like maybe one of those every couple months. So the fact that the games lasted me for months and months of time mm -hmm. was perfect. That was all I could afford. Like now, I don't have time to play a hundred hours of an RPG. It just there's no way like that plus all the other games I have to play for my job in order to like to stay current. It's really hard to actually uh, play through a full RPG and experience everything about it. So mm -hmm. I think that's true for a lot of people these days. I think that. Having a game that is um, a bit more focused, a bit shorter, does allow them to actually finish it and get the full experience out of it. And I think one of the benefits of an RPG is that you can replay it, you can make different choices, you can pick, build your character a different way and get a different experience. So even if a game is 30 hours long and you really, if you're really enjoying it and you want to play it again, you can get a different experience out of it for uh, the same, but not have to spend more money. You can just mm -hmm. get a different story entirely, depending on the choices you make. So, I think that's one of the things that make RPGs one of the the best value for, <laughs> for the dollar that you can get these days. Oh yeah, I mean, just pound for pound, you're not going to get a better deal in terms of entertainment. Yeah. <laughs> well, with this, the the more limited scope was that something that was there from the beginning. Or was it something that sort of evolved? Like, I think we should narrow this. I was just thinking about some of the stuff that was uh, either cut or wasn't in there. I know some people were talking about the the romantic options. I guess there must have been at some point at least a plan to have romance between the characters. Well, it's definitely, I mean, for, uh, for Outer Worlds, there's a thing that like, we discuss for a lot of our games. It's, it's just one of those things that it's hard to do well. Um, it's hard to have those feel meaningful like the interactions actually make sense without defaulting like this systemic thing where here i give you a gift now it's time for you to love <laughs> just it. thinking that <laughs> yeah it's that's like, not going to bring a tear to anybody's eye exactly yeah that or the uh okay we've now hit this this quest point so we're going to play some like pseudo erotic cinematic <laughs> having sex with a different bank and it's like 
okay, but not really what I'm looking for from my RPG. Um, I think it was interesting for the Outer Worlds that like the the romance effectively was between a companion and a different NPC, and that was their that was her quest specifically was helping her to make that emotional connection that she hadn't been able to make before. I think that we got a lot of great feedback from a lot of players mm-hmm. about that quest specifically in that that moment. So there definitely is like a huge demand for, for romance and deeper relationships in RPGs. It's just something that, honestly, with the Outer Worlds, given like our, our timeline and budget and the fact that we were building this game from scratch, like it was first game Obsidian done using Unreal 4 engine. So everything about the code base had built up from completely beginning. Like there were a lot of things that we wanted to do that we just had to say, it's just not feasible given the time and constraints we've got. So we just had to kind of pare back the feature set and pare back the overall scope of the game. So we could really focus on the, the polish and the quality and making sure it was a good solid experience for players. And I think that's the thing that people will like remember when they're looking back at the game in, in five, ten years is that there's even though there's certain things that aren't there that we maybe would all want, what is there is is, is high quality. Yeah, just what did you, are there people out there that are like, Man, this was a great game, I love this, it was awesome, but it didn't have those romance options, you know, so <laughs> I mean, is that like a, I was kinda of surprised. I mean that's an important thing for some people. I think it definitely is like um we have gotten feedback that people are like want romance or they want to uh, be able to romance specific companions. There was actually like one uh, uh, one reviewer I can't remember which site uh, they were writing for, but uh, they really wanted like they really wanted to romance Vicar Max, like mm-hmm. Daddy Max is what they call it. <laughs> like, okay, this person's okay, really into yeah. it. <laughs> Well, are you ready to move on to Tyranny then? Sure, yeah. So I got just tons of questions about about this game, and, and some from a mutual friend of ours, George. <laughs> uh, who, uh, by the way, thank you. I want to thank him for helping me contact you and get this all set up. And I had him on the show, of course, uh, back in November. Uh, but anyway, mm-hmm. here's here's uh, his question. <clears throat> he says, since I wasn't at Obsidian at the time Tyr- Tyranny was developed, how did that setting take shape? I thought there were a lot of interesting locations and characters. Who was involved in creating that world? Was it a collaborative, iterative effort, or was it mostly one or two people? So the actual the design for Tyranny kind of existed around the studio for, for years before I, got, I was involved with the project. Um, it was one that, um, while we were working on, on South Park and even before that, that uh, Chris Avalon and Fergus had been pitching around to various publishers looking for like they basically were trying to get like funding to make a, a Skyrim type or a Fallout New Vegas size RPG again. Um, that just financially wasn't happening with a lot of publishers. So after uh, when sorry, when the the Pillars of Eternity Kickstarter did so incredibly well, they took like that idea and kind of retooled it and pitched it to publishers as a as a game in the same style as Pillars of Eternity, more like the classic um, uh, Infinity Engine style game. And along the way, like the, the the actual IP went through several different iterations. So what was eventually pitched to Paradox, who was the publisher who, uh, who uh, published Tyranny, was very close to what the, the final like game concept ended up being. It was very much uh, the idea of like the evil overlord has already won. And... That was kind of like that core idea was there from the very beginning, effectively. It was definitely inspired by things like the uh, uh, the Glenn Cook Black Company series, yeah. um, Brendan Sanderson's uh, Mistborn trilogy. Like a lot of those, like fed into it. Um, and then once we started like working on the, the game further, like um, Chris spent uh, several months putting together like a world doc for for the IP for the game with some ideas for different locations, different characters, including a lot of the Archons. And then uh, the team took that and kind of ran with it further. So between myself, Matt McLean, who was lead writer on the project, um, uh, Constant Ga, who was lead area designer, and uh, Brian Menzi, who's a fantastic concept artist, has worked on every Obsidian game ever. Um, 
took a lot of those ideas and ran with them and just basically like flushed out who the archons were, um, came up with the idea of the, uh, the fate binder as, um, who the players like role in the world was. Like I really wanted to have, give the player a strong, like not define their character, but give them authority in this world. Mm -hmm. I think if you're with the concept of it being a, uh, a world where evil has won and you're part of the evil empire. I wanted you to not just be a foot soldier in the empire. I wanted you to have some, some skin in the game effectively. Mm -hmm. So certain choices that had been made were made by you and you were dealing with repercussions of those throughout the game. So um, a lot of it was, it was very collaborative within uh, like early pre-production was a small group of people that defined a lot of the early ideas for the, for the game and the IP and then as the team ramped up, as we got more uh, artists and area designers on the project, everyone brought their own ideas to the table for different uh, different parts of the game and how that develops. So um, the final result was very collaborative across the, the entire team, but it started off as like a small group of people who had the initial core ideas for everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just thinking, <clears throat> and some of the other interviews I read uh, with you, Brian, you're... Mm -hmm. Something I just hadn't wouldn't have, have thought about this, you know, as just somebody who's most basically playing these games. But <laughs> you know, the role of uh, artists and voice actors. I remember you had said sometimes that really you don't know who a character you wrote the mm -hmm. you know you don't even know if you like this character until you hear it voice acted, then it changes your. But like yeah. the concept artist, you know, the the role that they play. I mean, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. That's just something I know very little about. Well, it's one of those things that. A lot of times, like so, right now we're working on, on pre-production for for a game, and I'll have an idea of like, hey, it should be X, Y, or Z, and then we'll talk to a concept artist about it, and then they'll come back with, like, talk, say we're talking about a character, they come with like maybe a uh, a lineup of from six to twenty different silhouettes for that character, and you're going through looking for details of things you like, things that resonate with with your idea of the character, and usually it's like. A bunch, several different people all looking for things that, that speak to them based on the description of the character. And then you give a bunch of notes to the, the artist. They take that away and try and find some way to merge all those together into like a, 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 another set of ideas. Usually it's like they take that, that first lineup of 20 and come back with maybe three to five. And then you're just constantly iterating to narrow down. And eventually you get this, this concept backed for a character that's like, so much more than anything you thought it was going to be when you first had the idea, because it's not just like the only, the ideas you had initially, it's got the feedback from other people on the team. Plus that, like that artistic eye to really like capture the look and feel and tone of the character. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's so much more than what you expected. Like the, the, the early contacting phase is one of my two favorite parts of development on a game. Cause that's when, like a lot of like the, the the general vague ideas you've got in your head start becoming real because you start seeing what they could actually look like and you start getting excited for the potential for them. And then later on in development, when you actually start having like all the art come together and the voiceover and the audio, and it goes from being this like weird mix of gray box levels and kind of sort of implemented stuff to it's actually a real game now. It's like, like Pinocchio, it's a real boy. <laughs> it's a real game. It was like super excited to see everything together. <laughs> <clears throat> we kind of touched on this already. This is a question from Jer <clears throat> Jerome Rugrock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you were talking about this, the Black Company, uh, Malatzen, Book of the Fallen, the concept of the Archons reminded me of the Ten Who Were Taken. I know nothing about any of this. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, were they intended like that or something more like Aspect Demigods? Maybe here's the the question are there any plans to get more information about this world out there maybe for pen and paper rpg players um so <clears throat> definitely things like the black company was a, a definite inspiration for for tyranny and the archons it kind of started with the idea like the the 10 who were taken and evolved more into the the basic conceit of the world is that belief is a power that can affect and change the world and people who are famous, who are well-known, start being shaped by the beliefs people have about them. So it's not even something they necessarily control themselves. So uh, Graven Ash, who's one of the Archons, the, the Archon of War, we called him, was basically a general whose soldiers, like 
who kept winning against all odds and his soldiers kept believing that like he was unstoppable and that he would like shoulder their pain and shoulder the burden of their injuries. And that belief shaped him and turned him into this like semi mystical being that actually absorbed the pain and suffering of his soldiers and had to live with that pain himself. But it allowed his soldiers to fight and keep like standing up from mortal wounds on the battlefield and keep moving forward. So like he was actually like suffering intense pain all the time because every time one of his soldiers was wounded, he felt it, but it was a pain he was willing to bear in order to help his soldiers be better and to survive the battle. And all the archons were kind of shaped by that idea. So, and kind of that notion evolved over development. It was a thing that definitely started out with much more of like, possibly more the idea like, oh yeah, they're, they're powerful, specialized sorcerers kind of thing and turn into much more like as we evolve the idea of what belief was and how that affected the world, the archons kind of like the notion of what they were evolved over the development of the game. Um, as far as the IP for, for, uh, for tyranny, it's, it's one that like, I really, really, really would love to make more games set in that world. Like this is one of those things that if I, uh, if I won the lottery, one of the things I would do with the money is try to buy the IP from Paradox so I can make more games with it. Um, as far as I know, there's no plans currently in the works for Paradox to develop more with that that setting. I kind of wish that there was and that I could be involved in some way because it's, it's definitely a world that I'm very proud of being involved in. I think the team did a, an amazing job developing that IP, and there's a lot of stories that I would, I would love to still tell in that setting. I just need to get some lottery tickets. <laughs> maybe Jerome will come through with it. Just write you. Maybe he'll cut you a check. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so here's a question from Philippe Pepe. Uh, so he thinks tyranny's strength is in the story and the choices, and the combat is a weaker part. At least that's Philippe's opinion. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, he's curious if if you considered making the game combat free, and if you think that would work. Or is combat a vital part of this kind of RPG? Well, I think it was definitely one of the like, one of the central ideas of the game being it's more of an uh, Infinity Engine style game. It's kind of a uh, uh, the same vein of that style of game. Combat was central to mm. the the conceit of the game moving like, as we were developing it. Um, unfortunately, like the the balance did not work out as well as I think any of us would have wanted. Both on the development team and on the players who played it. So I definitely understand, understand that feedback. It's, a, mm -hmm. it's one of those like regrets you have is not being able to always like, like there's a saying that like uh, nothing is ever finished. It's only abandoned at a certain point. We had to uh -huh. move on with, with a uh, tyranny and release the game. I would have loved to be able to spend more time on the actual balance and tuning of the encounters to make it a uh, more fun experience. It's, Again, a, a regret I have uh, that I wasn't able to do that. So just more, a little more fine tuning, or is there? I mean, I think it was like overall not enough the, polish. <clears throat> not enough polish on the combat experience. I think it was, it was a factor of like balance as far as the difficulty of enemies, the pacing of combat encounters, and how many encounters there were throughout the mm -hmm. game. There was, like, there's a lot of factors that we could have that I wish we'd be able to spend more time on. Could you see yourself making a? RPG without combat? I could. Um, I'm trying to wrap my I head could. around that concept. I... <laughs> well, I mean, you look at something like uh, Disco Elysium. That's, okay. I mean, it's not like a full RPG. Um, it's, it definitely has RPG elements. It's like kind of like an adventure game with some fantastic dialogue, fantastic narrative exploration in, in the game. Um, uh I think so much of what people expect from an RPG is combat focused because of D and D roots and everything along those lines. I think if you made a pure, a pure RPG without combat, I think it'd be a very different experience than what most people would be necessarily thinking of as an RPG. It would mm -hmm. probably be something like more akin to Disco Elysium than a, uh, an Icewind Dale or Baldur's Gate, for example. So I think you definitely get a different audience gravitating towards that game. Oh, here's a, oh, well, Soren's got a bunch of questions. Wow. <clears throat> see, <laughs> I'm so academic. Uh, so scholarly, these questions. Let's see. Uh, critique of tyranny's ending often seemingly stems from an expectation or desire to see a traditional 
heroic arc rather than a negative arc. It does seem incomplete if viewed through the lens of a heroic arc. Was a negative arc intended and did the game not properly establish this question mark? <laughs> <laughs> Better you uh, than me on this one. <laughs> I mean, I think it's definitely true that the ending of Tyranny is rushed. It's uh, ultimately, while we were going through development of the game, we were looking at the, the overall story and what we were, were telling. Um, one of the original goals of the game that we discussed with Paradox was that it was going to be a shorter game. Like it wasn't going to be as long as Pillars of Eternity, but it was going to be one that would be, have a lot more replayability. Um, that was a very big pillar for Paradox. They actually wanted a game that had a ton of replayability in it, um, which the design for that that we came up with and worked out with them was, again, like, as you're playing through the game, there were three different, like there were different paths you could take through it, siding with the disfavored, siding with the Scarlet mm -hmm. Chorus, with the rebels, or kind of going the anarchist, play it your own way route. Um, as we were partway through development, um, when I was playing the game, I didn't feel we were hitting that goal. It was a bit more um, linear of an experience where there wasn't gonna be as much variety of replayability. So I made the call to, like, we had basically had to go back and make some significant story revisions to add in more of that replayability over mm -hmm. the course of Tyranny. That unfortunately affected how much time we had to develop on the end game. So that kind of suffered um, as a result of, of trying to achieve the, the goal for replayability. I think it's one that, uh, like, looking back, there's like, 50% of me thinks I should have done and made a different choice in that situation. I think, I think it was the right decision to do. It's like, it's one of those that uh, never feel, I don't know if I ever feel it was a, the perfect decision to make, but I think it was the right one given the goals we'd set for the game for ourselves and with the publisher. So, Yeah, <clears throat> he wanted me to pass on, let's see, thanks to whoever, ask you to give, <laughs> to give his thanks to whoever wrote Lantry's personal quest. Because that is such a pearl of silly, sad writing that somehow manages to sum up the entire game <laughs> for him. Uh, so Lantry was written by Matt McLean, who is the, the lead writer on Tyranny. That was one of the companions he wrote, and he did a fantastic job with that NPC. So um, I will definitely, uh, I'll, I'll definitely email him to let him know. <laughs> well, one of the things we definitely get in this game is a fairly sophisticated exploration i would say of the, the nature of evil and morality i mean we're a long we're light years beyond like the real simplistic <laughs> evil and i think you'd say somewhere about a mustachio mustache twirling yes <laughs> you know, we're getting a long ways to that idea and of course that's that you mentioned ultima a while ago and i was thinking of course about lord british mm -hmm. and ultima 4 and so I was wondering if you are you just interested in exploring evil philosophically, kind of an intellectual thing, or are you taking uh, are you kind of following Lord British and the idea that games ought to make people better people? <laughs> I mean, I think if we're lucky, anything we do can make people like think mm -hmm. about uh, choices they would make. Um, the problem I was I had before going into tyranny is that a lot of times I would play a game where the evil choice was essentially just kill everybody. And like without justification, without reason, it was just playing a psychopath. And while that's certainly a facet of evil, I don't think it's the only one. And I wanted to do a game that looked at evil from like a very different perspective, from somewhat like the both the mundane decisions and the fact that one of the things that we did, like, like making you a person of importance in uh, in the world as the the fate binder and tyranny, is that often you were like the only judge who could make a decision and those decisions were hard. There was no clear mm -hmm. good answer in any of the cases. It was always what is either the most bad or the least bad choice you want to make given the situation. Um, and in some cases we were, we tried to play against players desire to make everyone like you or be happy that actually trying to like, build the best rep with every faction and not taking a side actually led you to create some of the most horrific acts because you're just basically blowing in the wind with whatever the current prevailing like uh, demand was and no one was ever going to be fully happy with you as a result. So it was, I think that combined with trying to just look at if you're in this world with 
the archons and magic and part of the evil empire, what are the real struggles that you that we would you be put in in this situation, and how this is not just a simplistic good versus evil morality tale. We wanted you to really have hard choices to make that made you think and made you question whether it was the right choice or not. And I think that's an area where we succeeded greatly on Tyranny. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I uh, should be back next week, and I I think I might actually get uh, maybe two more, but definitely one more episode with uh, uh, with Brian. We haven't even got into the South Park game yet, so a lot of great stuff. The best is yet to come, so stay tuned. Uh, as always, I want to thank you. Thank you, 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 thank you. Have I thanked you? Thank you uh, for supporting uh, this show. I uh, really, really, really means a lot to me, guys. I mean, it's... You know, what can I say? I know a lot of people are going through pretty horrible times. Uh, you know, I don't want to be a downer here, but, you know, quite honestly, it's been kind of bad here, too. Uh, you know, what can we say? I know we're kind of all in this thing trying to get through. Uh, if you are, you know, in a good position, you know, you're in good health, your family and friends are fine, you uh, you got your job or you're, you're going back to work, everything is cool. Uh, then please do consider supporting the show. Just head over to that Patreon link in the show notes. A uh, dollar per show is all I ask. About a, I think it's about three bucks a month, uh, something like that. But I could really use your help because, you know, quite honestly, a lot of people have had to uh, suspend, <laughs> you know, sort of prioritize. I totally understand that. Uh, I don't blame them at all, but it is kind of, you know, kind of looking uh, kind of dire over there on Patreon. So, uh, again, please uh, chip in if you are able. And I do appreciate that. Uh, and, of course, uh, spreading the news on Twitter about new episodes, Facebook, all that good stuff. It uh, really means a lot to me, guys. So, once again, thank you. All right. What about that uh, news from the Mad Cave? All right, got a couple of items here to start off with on the tabletop uh, scene, if you will. Uh, first up is a Stargate SG-1 Phoenix role-playing game is getting an early launch. Uh, so this is by Darren of GateWorld. Uh, he says that publisher Wyvern Gaming has announced that the RPG will see an early launch at Gen Con uh, starting July 31st. And he describes the Stargate SG-1 Phoenix as a quote-unquote living RPG series. Players around the world participate in an ongoing campaign comprised of 13 episodes, in quotation marks for some reason, uh, written by the Wyvern T. Uh, season 1 will culminate in the final episode of the shared story to be released at Gen Con 2021. Uh, so it sounds pretty cool. You know, if you got a... You know, I know a lot of people are kind of getting back into uh, the tabletop stuff or doing uh, Roll20 and... Uh, uh, what's the other one? Uh, uh, Fantasy Grounds. You've know, been playing some games on that. You know, so if your group is kind of into Stargate, you might want to run that game past them. Sounds pretty cool. Uh, also, uh, Jim Johnson, uh, now switching from Stargate to Star Trek. Uh, Jim Johnson of StarTrek.com writes that Modifius Entertainment has announced a long-awaited Klingon edition of the Star Trek Adventures role-playing game. Uh, available now for print pre-order at Modifius.net. Or you can get the digital version immediately. Uh, the Klingon Empire Core rulebook, a complete alternative edition of the Star Trek Adventures role-playing game, uh, containing everything you need to explore the galaxy as fearless and honorable Klingon warriors. Uh, and so the ebook there is about 20 bucks. When you, when you adjust, adjust for inflation, GDP, I don't, <laughs> I don't even know what that is. <laughs> Not... Uh, Anyway, it's about 20 bucks for the ebook version and then $45 for the print book. Uh, so again, if you're kind of bored with the traditional, uh, you know, Dungeons and Dragons type stuff, you might want to try Star Trek. And uh, to be quite honest with you, I'd much rather play the Klingon side of things. Uh, I think those guys are awesome. <laughs> it's probably one of my favorite things about Star Trek. But anyway, uh, that's available over at Modifius.net. Uh, and then uh, finally, speaking of uh, you know dire financial situations, wait till you get a load of this. 
Uh, so Joel Haruska of Extreme Tech writes that after 15 years, retail video game prices may be rising. <laughs> uh, so apparently back in uh, 2005, all the big all the big players got together and decided they would uh, fix the prices basically uh, from 50 to 60 dollars or 49.99 blah blah blah. blah. Uh, so that's been the case all this time, even though of course inflation has reduced the value in absolute terms. You know, I thought it was this was crazy when you look at an old gaming magazines. If you have any old game uh, magazines, you know, flip through them sometime and look at the prices. And you, <laughs> man, that's like today's prices, <laughs> uh, even though the money was worth a lot more back then. So that gives you some clue uh, as to what this is about. Uh, but anyway, let's see. 2K is raising the price of its upcoming NBA 2K21 to base uh, $69.99, 70 bucks or up to $100 for this Mamba edition. Uh, so Joel here, you know, you should read this article because he makes some pretty good points about, you know, it's not necessarily a negative thing. You know, he says it could be a good thing. Uh, maybe the publishers will just raise the price, the retail price, and then that will let them cut down on all the microtransactions, loot crates, <laughs> sort, uh, sort of a shenanigans people don't like. Uh, that seems kind of optimistic to me. My guess is they will not... <laughs> reduce that <laughs> you know they really want to squeeze that last dollar from you so I kind of doubt it uh, but we'll see how it goes love to know what your take is you know do you think would you be willing to pay more for a game if it meant you didn't have to deal with the uh, microtransactions and all that sort of uh, uh, stuff you had to purchase in game to be competitive and whatnot it doesn't really apply to any of the games I play so I'd like to know what your thoughts are on it all right, I guess that will do it for the news. So how about a quote? And uh, if you get the time, go to, uh, to Brainy Quote, the site I use to get my quotes from, and type in tyranny. <laughs> a lot of, uh, there's just a lot of great quotations. I mean, a lot of the best thinkers. I mean, Plato's on there, all these uh, uh, sort of famous political philosophers, politicians, leaders. They've all got something to say on the topic. Uh, but I really like this quote. It's from an, uh, C.S. Lewis, who wrote the uh, Chronicles of Narnia. And I think, was that other one, the screw uh, tape papers or something like that? Uh, anyway, the quote goes something like this. Also did a lot of science fiction now that I'm thinking about it. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, the quote goes something like this. Of all tyrannies, a tyranny sincerely exercised for the good of its victims may be the most oppressive. So ponder on that and see you guys next time. Try to go through it. If you ask me, I don't believe the damn thing even exists. <laughs>